Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on the Focus on Why podcast, I am joined by Deborah Henley. Deborah, very warm welcome to you. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. Well, we've had this conversation of when are we going to have this recording? When are we going to do this? And it's been a few months and I'm so excited that today's the day on a beautiful sunny day. And let's just get, let's dive into it. Let's just get going. What is it that you're up to at the moment? Um, Well, what I'm up to at the moment is pretty much um, full circle from when we first started talking about doing a podcast, which I think might have been about eight months ago or something. Um, It's taken me a long time to get ready, to feel that I'm ready to to say what I'm doing, what I'm up to. But I think I'm doing the same thing that I (laughs) was doing all along, which is basically um, that I help corporate leaders to tell their own story so that they can connect and engage and inspire their own audiences. And I also work with speakers and kind of inspirational people that have stories to tell so that they can share those with other people in order to inspire them and, and share their message. And it's interesting that you said sort of, you've come full circle and, and yet you were sort of reticent to share what it was. What was the, the sort of the process that you've been going on in these last few months? I think the challenge was that I... Um, I wrote a book called Your Leadership Story, and the the subtitle is uh, Use Your Life Experience to uh, Influence and Inspire. And in the process of writing the book, it's a very interesting process writing a book because you start with a lot, kind of a lot of ideas, and then you have to sort of pull them all together into the salient idea which comes under the title so that you can say, this is what my book is about. It's about this one thing. And in a similar sort of way uh, in my working life, as we all have, we've got a lot that we want to share. If we're in this field of thought leadership or communication, coaching, uh, speaking, there's a lot that we want to share. And it's finding a way that we can simplify that and put it under one title. And none of those sort of titles seemed to fit. I felt as though they were boxing me in a little bit and there wasn't enough juice to them. This is one of the challenges I had in writing my book. There were five, it took me five years to write my book because there were times in which I thought I've lost the bit that I'm excited about. I've lost that that bit that really hooks me and therefore will hook my reader. And it's the same in my work. There's a lot of stuff I'm I'm sort of interested in, but I believe that we all have what I call a core message or mission, which is something that really excites us every time we find it and share it with our audience. So if you're in the kind of helping, guiding, teaching profession of any type, um, you will have something that really lights your fire and ignites your spark when you share it with other people. Um, And then there are times where you're less passionate um, and you go off focus. And I think for me, it was just that I had lost my, I had, I had lost the bit that really uh, made me feel passionate. And I think I found that again. Um, And I think what it is, is this idea that we all have a story to tell about who we are It's not necessarily true. We could all tell a different story about the life that we've had. And it would it could be more empowering. Um, You know, so you you can take two people that have had equally troublesome childhood and one will say, I had a terrible childhood. And the other one would say, um, you know, I, I had lots of challenges which I grew and learned from. And one is kind of you could say the second one is more of the growth mindset and The second one is an empowering story. And if somebody tells that story of their life, they'll find that they can go on and be fueled to have greater sort of successes and and realize their ambitions in life. And as a leader, it's really important that we know how we tell our story or how we speak about who we are, 
because we presumably want to take people somewhere. A leader is someone who mobilizes people to go from one space to another and, uh, in a way that they wouldn't otherwise do without that leadership. And um, an empowering story is the kind of the fuel, the narrative that gets people there. It gives them the faith and the trust that they can go from one place to another. So there's a, I mean, there, there are a lot of ideas in that. Um, but I, I think, you know, for, for now, that's that. I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> It, it more more than does. It's fabulous, and I have I have several questions in response. And the first one is, where as a leader do you want to take your people? Mm. Well, that is that's a very interesting question. Do you mean where do I as a leader myself? Yeah. Um, where does yeah. a leader generally want to take the people? Um, for me, I'm going to answer for myself because I think the answer is that it's different in each case and for each leader. Um, but I want to take the the person. Um, I want to take people to the fulfilment of what is what I believe is my core message, which is um, I want to take people uh, to a place of having the courage to fully express their truth, to understand what really sparks them, and be able to shine with that. So to really identify what gives them passion and what gives them purpose in life and when they've identified that to have the courage to stand up and say this is who I am and I think that's really important to me because uh, growing up I grew up in Hong Kong as a child uh, we moved there when I was five years old and I went to lots of different schools there and then when I was 11 my parents uh, got separated and my mother came back to England I went to three different boarding schools. Um, and I went to a couple more schools in between. I, and all in all, I went to eight different schools and I went to lots of places of further education, one of which we shared. <laughs> we went to the same university, which is uh, great. And, and what it meant was because I was constantly having to go in front of new groups, I had to learn to be really adaptable and to be amiable, to make friends quickly and to quickly say, this is the story of who I am in a way that people would want to connect with me and, and be my friend. Um, and they, they were great traits. They're really useful for me um, as somebody who spent the last 10 years until the uh, pandemic, traveling around the world, running workshops and walking into roomfuls of people and, and having to adapt and accommodate and um, fit in. But what it did mean was in all that fitting in and conformity, I wasn't always allowing myself to stand out or to express my truth. I didn't want to be the weird one or the quirky one or the person with a, a very different sort of life experience or perspective. And what I've learned over the years is it's that very difference, my own unique perspectives, and this would apply to everybody, our own, everybody's own unique perspectives that are their greatest assets, particularly as leaders. It's that ability to think for yourself, to see things in your own way, and to have your own kind of take on things that can really take other people places. And I think it gives permission, most of all, it gives permission for other people to express their own truth and their own uniqueness. So I suppose I'm on a real mission to work, uh, to, to enable corporates to uh, help people to be, to be sort of more fully expressed, to bring all those wonderful, different, diverse opinions, um, unique ideas, uh, energies into the workplace and not feel that they're all subsumed by the Borg. I don't know whether you remember the Borg, it's from, from um, Star Trek, where um, everybody is assimilated by the Borg and they all become kind of a, a bunch of zombies. And I sometimes think that our you know, corporates are kind of like this great big machinery that's sucking people in. And indeed, I used to work with a, a great big management consultancy, a global management consultancy, working with young people, um, university graduates, um, when they were first being enrolled in their induction programs. And I would meet the same groups three or four years later, and the light had gone out in their eyes, you know, many of them. And these were wonderful, bright young things that had so much to offer the world. And they had started to conform and adapt and be the person that the environment they're in wanted them to be, rather than those wonderful different traits that they, they express that probably got them um, the job in the first place. So that for me is really tragic. 
And that motivates me a lot. You know, I hate the fact that all these wonderful people are kind of losing their 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 soul or, or losing the courage to express it. And then I also feel very um, well, I feel very strongly about the crazy irony that when people get into more senior leadership positions in corporate environments, and I've worked for one of the big four management consultancies and saw this firsthand, that when people got into partnership levels or senior leadership roles, suddenly they were expected to have gravitas and to have charisma and to, to have uh, innovative thoughts um, and to be able to lead with their thinking as opposed to just follow and say the same thing as everybody else. Leadership was required, fresh thinking was required. But how do you do that if you've spent, you know, 20 years of your career saying, yes, yes, I'll be whatever you want me to be. I'll, do, I'll follow the competency framework. In fact, somebody came to me for coaching with exactly that dilemma. He, he had a, a stunning uh, career in one of the big four, not the same one I worked in, but another one. And he was a, trying to knock on the door of being made partner. And they said, you've had an amazing career. You're very good at what you do technically, but go away and get some charisma and gravitas. And it, it's what I call that spark. It's finding that, that energy, um, that uh, self-awareness and purpose and passion um, that, and well, other, I, I could go into spark in more detail, but I won't, <laughs> I don't know. Should I go into the spark in more detail? Well, absolutely. I mean, and from the perspective of, you said that the light goes out in people's eyes and, mm. and there is this paradox of, of, being able to speak up and being an individual and yet needing to conform and fit in, you know, that is a, a whole bizarre concept in itself that, you know, we, we in society or in companies or in our everyday life, we have that constant uh, need to swing from one position to another where we want to fit in. We want to stand out, but we don't want to stand out for the wrong reasons. And, and I, I love the the expression that you have about wanting to to reignite the spark and and recognizing that it's there to be lit as well, you know, and seeing almost the the hidden potential within people. I find that the the spark in people is something that can certainly dwindle. Um, I call it the shadow side of the spark. So uh, people can be exposed to environments or situations in their life that really um, makes this spark just become, you know, nothing but an ember sometimes. Um, and I'm sure we've seen this a lot in, during the pandemic because of the pressures that's put on people. But um, it could be anything, it could be financial, it could be relationship pressures, it could be work pressures. And when that spark goes, there are some, some key things we need to do to bring it back. But let me just say a little bit about what, the shadow spark is, you know, I think of S-P-A-R-K. It can come about through struggle, pressure, anxiety, reactivity. So reacting to things out of a pattern as opposed to creating a response. And then the K is through what I call kowtowing to a limited idea of who you can be. So we limit ourselves, we kowtow to the status quo. It might be we kowtow to what our family think we should be, or we kowtow to what our friends or our environment, our peers think we should be, or, or it might be in the workplace. Um, but all of those things, that struggle, pressure, anxiety, reactivity to what's going on, those old patterns and the kowtowing can just mean that we, we find ourselves very boxed in and hemmed in. And it can be very difficult to have any, any energy to do anything. Uh, so I think you know, it's really important that people recognize that they might be in, in a position where their spark just needs a little bit of enlivening. Um, it needs a bit of care and attention. And so the other side of the spark, how do we get out of it? Again, sort of you know, following the SPARK acronym, um, at the S is for self-understanding. And that's the first thing. And that's not just self-awareness. It's not just being aware. It's showing some kindness and compassion, understanding ourself. Give, you know, give yourself some understanding uh, what's going on for you. And then the P is to start finding a purpose, a purposefulness 
in, in what we're doing. And then A is an appreciation for everything that um, we've got available. You know, uh, there are three things we can appreciate. Um, appreciate that we have uh, other ways of doing things. Appreciate all that we've got, all the qualities we've got, and appreciate that there are people in our lives that can help and support us and show us a different direction. And then the R is the opposite to the reactivity, and that's becoming responsive. So we create a response. We stop when something happens and we go, how about I try a new way of doing things? I don't have to keep doing things that same old, same old way. There are new ways of doing things. And then we, with the K, we go from kowtowing to a limited, limited idea of who we can be to kind of saying, well, who could I be? And the K is for know-how. You know, if you want to write a book, develop the know-how to do it. If you want to stand up on a stage and speak, you need to develop the know-how. Um, and that will give you back your spark. And one thing that really sparks me is, uh, one thing I've always loved is sailing, dinghy sailing any kind of sailing, sail racing, it's always given me back my spark. Um, but I haven't done very much dinghy racing. And so I challenged myself to develop the know-how to do that. And I signed myself up last week after a year of working hard and not taking a break. I thought it's time for a break. And I signed myself up on a dinghy racing course with a bunch of teenagers. Uh, and I was one of only two adults and there are about 20 teenagers. Um, and it was brilliant. It was humbling. You know, I, I was amongst people that the uh, these kids that were absolutely fantastic kind of pointing out how I could be sailing the boat better. Um, but it, it was also really refreshing. It, it, it sort of ignited the spark. I was putting myself out up for a new challenge um, and rewarding myself. And that's something that I I think I've learned over the last year, particularly that we can act safely and comfortably and we can say this is this is who I am this is my purpose this is what I'm all about but that does not make your eyes shine that's a kind of level of comfort where you go I know what I am I know what I stand for um, and that's great and we can be, we can sort of settle back into that and go I know the formula for success for me but the spark thing is discovering the new edge it's going how can I challenge myself what can put me out of my comfort zone um, so that I'm into a new place? Um, and I, I learned that because some of the people I coach, I, I work both, I run training courses and workshops in, in corporate environments, but I also have a handful of people that I coach one-to-one, -one, six people every year. And the only people I coach are people that I find really inspiring. That's, the, that's basically the criteria for me working with them. Um, I'm inspired by that. There's something about them that I'm just really intrigued with, and I just love to know more about them. And um, I was working with a, a bunch of people, and I suddenly thought, all of these people have something in common. Not only are they all challenging themselves or have challenged themselves in the past, but they are all challenging themselves in the present. And I look back at my life and I thought, yeah, I can tell lots of stories of challenges I've had and I've faced and I've overcome, but I'm getting a little bit comfortable now. I'm just kind of sitting pretty and easy, kind of going, this is what I do. Um, and when was the last time I really put myself in an uncomfortable position? And so I said to myself, well, one thing I've becoming, I'm becoming you know, comfortable off living off the fats of the land and, and not doing very much exercise. And so I, the first thing I did was um, do the couch to 5k. I was definitely closer to the couch than the 5k. Uh, and, you know, challenged myself to go out and I could barely run for more than a minute or two. And then it was, it was at a slow jog. And then one of the people I was working with said, you know, you should try CrossFit, which is really tough um, workout but it's all scalable they said you can be scale it to any level so I started doing uh, CrossFit and um, a couple of weeks ago I, I took part in the CrossFit Open um, so nine months of doing that I, I'm now able to you know do quite a lot of I'd say I'm sort of 
pretty fit, averagely fit, average to pretty fit for someone who's about to turn 50 next week. (laughs) But that was my challenge. And, you know, fitness isn't the challenge for everybody. But I I recognise that that was something that was missing in me. And I I wanted to relive that buzz that I had had uh, in my youth when I when I did a lot of stuff, you know, fitness stuff like you. uh, I was an oars woman and um, a competitive swimmer as well. And I just missed that sense of being fit and healthy. And I thought if I'm going to talk about regaining your spark, not only do I need to be challenging myself and putting myself in uncomfortable positions, but also I need to have that that energy about me, um, that you know visceral energy, that physical energy. When I'm on stage or with people in person, I have to walk my talk. And if I'm going to be talking about this stuff, you know, I can't just be very lethargic and tired. You know, who I, I, I've got, I'm a huge believer that our, you know, our body is as much of us. We're not just a, a mind and a body. You know, they're not two separate things. Every cell of us kind of expresses who we are. And uh, it's really important, I think, that we are kind of fully engaged in our body. But, you know, the body story could be a whole separate uh, conversation that we could go down. I love I love the whole spark process that you've you've taken us through, both the shadow side and the the sort of the bright side elements. When people when you're taking people through the spark process, what do they what do they get stuck on? Do there, there any elements that really particularly challenge them? I think there's partly a sense that uh, either people don't think that they've got something particularly unique to offer the world or they don't see how that thing that they're passionate about is of real value because for them it seems so normal and natural. So I think we, you know, that it's I call it the diamond and the shit which is this um which is the thing that we find that gives us kind of reassurance and and hope and salvation in our darkest times so when we're kind of going through the shit we're going through dark nights of the soul there's a light that is lit for us and I don't and for each person it can be different but it's it's some idea of hope or it's an idea of something that really matters and you suddenly, and that's kind of the purpose. That's that spark that crystallizes for us. And we go, yes, this is something that really matters to me. And I want to, uh, and this will help me. So for some people that can be, um, I, I have to create, or for somebody else, it might be, um, you know, I, I need to save the world or, you know, the oceans or for somebody else, it might be, um, children and young lives really matter but it's something that really becomes very very important for people and it's sometimes hard to see when our lives are very bright and happy you can't see the light when things are very bright but when things are dark uh, we can sometimes see it but then have a hard time believing it really matters and there's that who am I to bring this out who am I to put my head above the parapet and speak about this. Aren't there other people who are better qualified to speak about this than I am? Isn't this a bit glib? Isn't this a bit obvious? And actually, most of these ideas do sound glib and obvious and cliche because they're shared ideas and they're important ones and they matter. So what really matters to you, Deborah? (laughs) What a brilliant question. I think what really matters is being able to not hide, to be able to be your raw, honest self, to say, this is how I see things. This is my truth. It doesn't have to be the truth, but this is how I experience the world. Yeah, so it's back to not conforming and adapting. People having the opportunity to have the courage to stand up as the, what I, their true and wonderful selves. <laughs> and when you say not hiding, who would they be hiding from or who, who are you not hiding yeah. from? Well, I, you know, I, I think it, it's hiding 
it's wanting to be accepted and appreciated not judged and condemned i in i came to this sort of conclusion many years ago i worked with people in addiction recovery and i ran a lot of groups for people um who had all types of different stories and experiences and a reason and reasons for um, their journey through addiction. But I realized that I, I concluded that all anybody wanted was for it to be okay to be who they are. And I already said that, you know, in, in my own past, I felt it wasn't always okay to be who I was. I thought I would get on better if I, if I, you know, fitted in. Um, it, it, it's a it's a very difficult tension. It's because, of course, we have to um, we have to fit in to an extent. <laughs> we have to be sort of palatable, but I think we we just sacrifice too much of ourselves too often. I just think it's wonderful when you just scratch below the, the surface of people and so many people have such wonderful experiences to share and, and wonderful insights. There are so many interesting people out there and I've seen it through my, my past as a psychotherapist and, and now as a coach and particularly helping people share their stories and their missions out in the world. But so many people have such wonderful things to offer and to share, ideas, thoughts angles on things and stories to tell background stories as to why this matters to them uh, you know and i think it's really important that people understand the connection between their mission and the story the what the why it matters to them and i'm sure you've had, yes it is the why i'm sure you have the same experience you know just you know what what extraordinary lives people have and extraordinary things people have to say but a lot of people have have lost those under layer upon layer upon layer of saying it's not okay to be me i have to be the person that my parents wanted me to be or society wanted me to be or you know my peer group wanted me to be and they're kept you know trapped in that and held back so yes i think for me it is just sort of taking away those layers and saying to people it's not just okay to be the the wonderful you it is your greatest asset if you can be open and, and share who you are. Because when you open yourself up and you share your story, people can very quickly uh, not just get engaged with what you have to say, not just, uh, there are three layers. One, connect and engage with you. But the second one is to develop trust in, in who you are, trust and loyalty. And the third thing is, uh, inspiration and influence so those are the three kind of reasons why we need to sort of <laughs> open up it makes such a difference and uh you know you kind of wonder why there are so many people that do the opposite that shield themselves off um and put on suits i mean we don't you don't wonder because i can understand it but and i've done it myself and you know when i I, I moved from being a person in personal development field, um, psychotherapist, into the corporate world, and I went to work in financial services in the city. And I remember when I made that transition, I put on my suit and I made my commute, and I felt as though uh, I was in an episode of a program called Faking It. I don't know whether you remember it, but it's a program where you take somebody from one area of life, like somebody who flipped burgers for a living, and then they go and learn to be a Michelin chef. And then at the end of it, you had to guess who was the Michelin sh chef, you know, uh, and who was the burger flipper. <laughs> and I felt like I was doing that. I, I dressed myself up as a corporate person. I sounded right. I spoke the right way. I knew it wasn't rocket science and I could get away with it. But I also felt as though I, I, I was faking it. And I'm not talking about imposter syndrome. Uh, I'm talking just about the fact that I was just dressing up in a role. I didn't feel like an imposter. I just felt that I was um, playing out a role as many other people are. And in fact, we're always playing out roles. I mean, I probably, even as a psychotherapist, um, whilst that demanded a, a huge level of honesty in some ways, that also demanded a barrier. 
So I was playing a role there, which might have been different from the role I played with my friends. And so I think it's just the level at which we do that. You know, I, I think it's okay to play a role if we kind of are knowingly doing it. But we also have to identify, but what's the bit that gives me real passion? Back to that spark idea. What's the bit that really makes us shine? Um, we sometimes have to perform roles just because for functional necessity. Um, and we have to sort of fit in and conform. And it's sometimes easier and we can make choices to do that. I think where it's a tragedy is where we've lost our sense of self. You, you spoke about that right at the beginning about having the the sort of the boxes that we get boxed in and that we have these titles. And it's interesting because I, I recently I was talking on one of my reflections episodes about the, the requirement for labeling and and how that can be important and and relevant if we're categorizing sort of danger and safe things and we're, we're from an evolution perspective but if we're talking about labels and how we then use that in regards to people that can be really dangerous and if we're doing that to ourselves even again even more so it can be super toxic in in that respect and it was something that's come to mind was what Ricky Arundel shared in their episode was about a book that they'd read called well, I can't remember the name, but it was about the, the key element is, is was if I'm a, I'm afraid to tell you who I am, because if I tell you who I am and you don't like who I am, that's all I have. Mm. And it seems really relevant to what you've just been sharing about having all these different layers that we, we do have. And there is a complexity in that, in, in the respect that we are playing different roles, that we have got societal, parental, peer expectations that we we'd have to adhere to and you say you're playing a role and you're putting on the right clothing to make yourself fit in and then often you do lose that identity you do lose who you really are and it, it is that process of as you say you're talking about your spark of reigniting and just coming back to it and so you say you spent a few months recently doing that whole circular is this what I'm doing? Is this really what who I am? Is this what I want to do, as you say? And, and where does that energy really come from? And it, you know, it it comes back to that. This is who I am. This is this is the real me. So who is the real Deborah? Is is it the one in a sort of various sort of like raw wetsuits on on the on the sailing boat, or is it the one with the suit? Or, you know, <laughs> who is the Deborah? Well, it's a little bit like a recipe, isn't it? I mean, um, the, these are the different components of my life and uh, that make up the cake. And, you know, without the eggs, it might the cake might not bind. And, you know, if I don't have the me in a wetsuit going swimming in Shepparton Lake or, or going sailing, then, you know, something's going to feel as though it's missing for me. And but also if I don't have my work and I don't have my uh, opportunities to go out and, and speak or work with people, then the, another huge part will be missing. So I'm all of those things. Um, but I'm just reminded of um, a quote, uh, what you were saying there. Um, I'll, I'll remember who it's by in a minute, but it says it's better to be. I'd rather be hated for who I am than loved for who I am not. But I think that takes a lot of courage. You've got to know it's worth being who you are first, uh, rather than seeking love from other people. And that's what it comes down to. It's this external locus of control where we want to be accepted and appreciated and loved from outside ourselves than finding that um, self-approval and appreciation and love from within um, I think there's there's a Byron Katie who's uh, who's written some wonderful books. Um, one is called Loving What Is, um, but she talks about uh, sort of a prayer to say, you know, help me to be released from the need to be accepted, appreciated, and approved of. You know, free me from that. And I think it's a it's a it's a lifelong challenge to learn to live life on our own terms and say what is it that really makes me feel um a sense of uh, accomplishment and well-being and achievement what are the things that are necessary what are these ingredients that are necessary for me in my life and I, I came to the conclusion a few years ago that I for me I have to have an area of creative outlet so I signed up for some oil painting classes on a Monday night 
um, and I, I have to do something creative. I need to have some time in nature out and about, you know, and so I've just been for a walk in Richmond Park, which was stunning. It's a beautiful day and the sky is blue and the flowers were out. It was, and the trees are just majestic and wonderful and all their knots. And it's just, it fulfills me and gives me so much. And then the third thing is having some form of exercise, probably involving water, um, but getting out, you know, in or on the water in some capacity and doing that. And if I have those three things, as well as my work, which I'm passionate about, I think the, my work is a sort of, is an expression of kind of my whole evolution. I, I think my personal development and my professional development are in, completely intertwined with one another. Then, then I kind of, I've got that level of happiness. And I think I've then got an abundance of ability to share with other people and help other people on their kind of journeys through life to be, to become greater leaders or to, you know, I, I overcome issues and challenges in their life. I mean, I'm more oriented towards um, achieving and accomplishing what people want to accomplish nowadays um, than the, the problem orientation when I was more working in therapy. Um, but in all aspects, it's it's helping people make a similar sort of transition to re-embrace what really matters to them and and give themselves permission to say i put the i put these things higher up in my priority my list of priorities the things that matter to me really matter <laughs> you know i i it's really important that people live their lives you know in a full way we get this shot at life and if we spend 20 years of it making somebody else happy and not ourselves you know what a tragic waste of of 20 years of our lives i mean we can we can think of that whether we're parents or in partnerships or working for the man as they say you know are we still having that level of fulfillment it's really important as a parent i think it's really important to um show your children that you you know what fuels your passion and how to live it and that's such a lovely gift to give our children and you say about the the giving ourselves permission and then prioritizing you know what's important to us why why are we reticent to to just naturally do it why is it we have to give ourselves permission in the sense that it's it, it it's almost a a process or an excuse that we have to justify to, to do that yeah I know, I know it just see it seems crazy doesn't it but I think there's a sense that it's really selfish to to go and just please ourselves and yet it's the most selfless thing to do and it's not really about just pleasing ourselves I'm, I'm not talking about the short-term rewards of indulging and in drinking and eating and uh, you know gambling or, or whatever those sorts of things that that's the reactive behavior that um, diminishes our spark I'm talking about the things that really affirm life for us that honor our soul those are the things that really matter it uh, sure it's fun to have you know a bit of a party and I you know I'm not saying that we all need to be you know we can enjoy ourselves um but it's it's knowing the difference between what are the things that are just sort of quick fixes that might just sort of boost us and what are the these lifelong passions and yearnings that we that really give us joy at a different sort of level you know that real sustainable joy that that lights up you know light lights us up lights up our spark enables us to shine well I love that. And I, I, I think that's the perfect note to, to sort of close out on, on, on the joy and the shining. Um, how would people get in contact with you, Deborah? I'm constructing my new website, which is deborahenley.com. So that look out for that. I'm, I'm hoping that'll be up in the next couple of weeks. Um, currently, I am at vivacitygroup.co.uk. So that's deborah at vivacitygroup.co.uk. And my book is on Amazon. It's Your Leadership Story by Deborah Henley. 
Um, so that's probably a good way of finding me. I'm, I'm also developing my yourleadershipstory.co.uk website as well. So that's that's the work I've got planned over the next month to get those two things up. But, you know, love I love to hear from, from anybody. And uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Amy, at last about all of these things. It's been a wonderful conversation and I thank you so much for coming on Focus on Why and, and for lighting the spark for so many people because I think that by sharing the, what your journey has been and, and how you've come to the conclusion that this is who I am, you, you will be helping others to, to think about their why again from multiple perspectives and, and stripping back the layers to understand what's at the core is so important. So thank you for that. How would you like to close out the episode today? What are your final words? I would just like to say to people, you know, number one, look for that thing that really sparks you up or those things. And number two, have the courage to let yourself shine. Express yourself. You know, don't be afraid to let yourself shine brightly because it only lights up other people and it lights up other people's paths. It doesn't diminish anybody else. And I think that's often another reason why people don't like to, to shine. Allow yourself to shine brightly because it could just be that what you have to share are exactly the words that somebody else needs to hear. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20 minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.